Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Not long ago, I received a message asking this question. The person wanted to know if I was a universal restorationist. And I thought, well, before I can answer that question, I better look it up and find out what it means. I suspected that I wasn't one. (laughs) And sure enough, uh, with a little research, I discovered that, yes, I'm not one at all. I thought it would be fruitful and helpful uh, to cover this ism, universal restorationism, uh, in our ongoing uh, ism uh, s- series. So, what is universal restorationism? Well, it is a view uh, that, in many ways, is uh, no different from universalism, the idea that all people will one day be redeemed. Now, it has a couple of uh, nuances that should be added. First of all, universal restorationism uh, takes the view that not only will all humans ultimately be restored to uh, fellowship with the living God, but all sentient beings, including all the fallen angels. Uh, this is the view that in the end, everything is reconciled to God. Now, it's distinct uh, from universalism, not only in that it includes non-humans, but all sentient uh, beings, but also uh, in this way. It affirms that this happens by God's grace. Now, there remain uh, various ways in which that can come to pass. There are those who would say uh, that God has ordained from all eternity that everyone would be saved and uh, that, therefore, uh, God's sovereignty brings this to pass. There are others who would say that God has given us the gift of free will and that, in the end, we will all freely uh, choose to uh, repent and to believe. Uh, So there's a sense in which this view uh, looks at uh, hell uh, as essentially a kind of purgatory. Now, annihilationism is a view that holds that uh, those who are not in Christ will cease to be. And many annihilationists believe that they will cease to be after some time of torment in hell. They're trying to recognize the clear biblical language with respect to the existence of hell uh, while uh, avoiding having to embrace the eternality of hell. So they embrace an annihilationist position that you you uh, if you're outside of Christ you die you go to hell you spend some time there and then you are no more well this affirms agrees with that in the sense that the suffering that a person would go through in hell would be temporal and not eternal but instead of at the end you would cease to be at the end you would be brought into heaven now there was in the history of the universalist church uh, a dispute over this very issue. That is, the general uh, perspective of the universalists was that this idea of a purgatory-style hell, a temporal hell, uh, was incoherent and irrational because it was built on the temporariness of it was built on the universality of the atonement of Christ. So that if Jesus died for everybody's sins and everybody's sins are going to be forgiven, what is the point of this time uh However brief or long it may be, though keeping in mind that compared to eternity, it's necessarily brief. Uh, What's the point if the sins have already been covered? 
Well, from the other side, uh, from the uh, universal restorationist side, the side that affirms this kind of purgatory, they felt like, hey, there's, there's a moral incongruence, a lack of things matching up morally if there is no suffering for those outside of Christ. So that, for instance, if someone is doing some sort of uh, grave evil and dies in the process of that, say I'm I'm Hitler uh, and I have uh, you know committed this great war and this Holocaust, and then I die by killing myself and my bride. Uh, surely it doesn't make sense that I would go straight to heaven. Well, isn't it interesting that? Uh, implicit in that perspective is some level of uh, self-righteousness. That is, well, we can't have these really bad people going straight to heaven. They have to suffer for a while. They have to contribute to uh, the removal of their own sin. Well, very quickly in the time that I have remaining, uh, this person that asked, I said, no, I'm not this at all. I think the Bible is abundantly clear uh, on a number of things. One, that hell is forever. Two, that people go to hell. Three, uh, that uh, there is no other chance after we die. There is no other chance after we die that what comes is death and then comes the judgment. When we die, we stand before the throne of God and it's his declaration at this point that matters. I don't believe that the sinners in hell have the capacity to embrace the work of Christ any more than they did on earth. In fact, I'd say they have less of a capacity because there's not even any common grace involved in their life at that point. So universal restorationism is not in the least bit uh, biblical. It is a kind of rebellion against uh, what God has revealed and so should be rejected. We have in our ongoing series that we call Parables uh, made it all the way through the Gospel of Matthew. And I should mention before we turn our attention uh, to those parables that show up in the Gospel of Mark, which we haven't covered already, uh, that the Bible doesn't come to us color-coded. Uh, that is, uh, there are parables and then there are parables. And I had to make a decision about what to consider a parable and what not to consider a parable. Some lists of parables, in fact, will include just about any kind of uh, analogy whatsoever. And I have tried to skip over those. Uh, there's Jesus, for instance, speaking about the uh, old wineskins and new wineskins and and patches and what happens and I haven't included those and as we do continue to go forward uh, adding more gospels to our list uh, we will not uh, do that again but we also will not repeat the ones that were already covered earlier so we come today uh, to Mark chapter 4 uh, where Jesus, and this is one of the sort of ways that I kind of clue in, okay, this is going to be a parable. Uh, Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Now, at the very beginning of this series, I reminded you that there are two different uh, kinds of errors that we can make when we come to the parables. One of them is when we sort of jump 
out of the parable too quickly. When we, we find one point and we plant our flag there and we say, okay, everything else is window dressing. This is all Jesus was trying to communicate, just this one narrow point. The other mistake is to try and turn every parable into an allegory where every element in the story has to have uh, a a representation or serve as a symbol of some kind. This is one of those places where I think we're more apt uh, to make that second mistake because Jesus takes the time to describe uh, the process by which grain grows. He talks about first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it. Uh, we want to know, okay, well, what's the stalk? What's the head? What's the full kernel in the head? I could be wrong, but uh, I'm inclined to say uh, those are the parts of grain, <laughs> just like sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. I think instead, the central point that Jesus is trying to make here in this parable is that the kingdom itself grows in ways that we're not able to see in the same way that grain grows in ways that we're not able to see. I, I, I think I'm, it's better to sort of zero in on these words. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, this is the man who scattered the seed. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts. So it's not about the man. It's about the seed and it's about the soil. Now, I'm in the uh, process right now, uh, early in the process, but not brand new in the process of seeking to plant and grow a church here in the Fort Wayne area. Sovereign Grace Fellowship is the church uh, that I am planting and serving. We've been meeting for several months now, uh, and it, I'm trying to uh, reach out to people and talk to people about the church, some that are believers, some that are not believers. Uh, and part of my motivation, I confess, is that I'd like to see the church grow. At the same time, however, I have to acknowledge that I, I don't really know how churches grow. This is the third church that I've planted in my life, and I've seen them grow, but I don't know how they grow. What I know is God is at work. God brings people into our lives. Just the other day, again, relative to another uh, project that we're working on, uh, this this uh, pastoral college for uh, preparing men for gospel ministry, uh, I had a meeting scheduled with uh, a group of uh, elders at a church in another state. Uh, we we're going to meet online, and I got a friend request from a fellow and said, hey, uh, I'm here. I'm ready. I know that you guys are having your meeting, and whenever you're ready for me, I'll be here. I just wanted you to know that. Well, the fellow who sent the message or the friend request was not the fellow I was scheduled to meet with. I thought he was. I made that mistake. Um, but this is a fellow that might have an interest in our pastoral college. So, again, God works in mysterious ways. That's, I think, what Jesus is emphasizing here, that the kingdom isn't something that comes when we find the exact right procedure to make it come to pass. Rather, the kingdom is that which comes as we seek to be faithful, we scatter the seed, and we wait and we hope. If you've got another view, I'd love to hear from you. If you think uh, it's important for us to know what the stock represents in the head and the full kernel in the head, I would love to hear. And I would love to share what you've got uh, with others in the future. But for now, central to the story, God gives the increase. We are all tempted. To be practical deists. The deists were the poster children for God of the Gaps theology. And that is because they wanted the universe to make sense, but didn't want to have to answer to the living God. They posited a creator God. For how else could we have gotten here? 
who, after creating the universe, took a walk, never to return. God explains the universe, but is not active in it. If he's watching at all, it is from a distance and with a deep indifference. A practical deist isn't someone affirming deism, but who's also handy with tools. But rather, it's someone who would never affirm such a doctrine, but lives as if that doctrine were true. A deist in practice, if not confession. And that's where we come in. We who are reformed confess with our fathers this. What are God's works of providence? God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. That's question 11 from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. But we act as though all his creatures and all their actions are somehow outside of his control. We too often treat answered prayer as a vaguely embarrassing pseudo-charismatic event. God, we seem to believe, may be Lord of space and time, but he is an absentee Lord. The proof is in the worry. Don't get me wrong, the doctrine of God, of God's providence rather, doesn't mean that unpleasant or horrific events will not come to pass. Worry, however, isn't the understandable fear that something terrible might happen, but the foolish fear that things outside his sovereign plan might happen. Worry is the implicit denial of the promise of God in Romans 8.28, that all things, that is, all things, work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. The solution to our worry is to cease living by sight to believe the invisible. All that we see is real enough. The actions of wicked men at the abortion mill in the Middle East, the ravages of disease, these are all real as well. And they all have genuine causal power. They bring things to pass. But each of them is but a secondary cause, a tool in the hand of the one who governs all the creatures and all their actions. He is sovereign over men and over disease and always brings his sovereign will to pass, even when such violates his revealed will. Indeed, this is precisely how we have been saved. He brought to pass the greatest evil ever, the death of the innocent man, and by it redeemed our souls. But even here, friends, we can still be stuck in our deism. When we confess to his sovereignty, and by that we merely see him as the one who wrote the full story of history, who numbered our days before there were days, who planned the descent of every hair falling from our heads, when we affirm it, he wrote the story, but miss out the fact, miss out on the fact that he doesn't merely sit back and watch it play out. The glorious, though invisible truth, is that he wrote himself into the story. He who created space and time, 
who is above space and time, also enters into space and time. The king's heart is in his hand, and so is mine. Great and small, the good Lord is at work in them all. He is here, and he is not inactive. Be of good cheer, for though he is risen, though he is seated at the right hand of the Father, though he is exalted, having received all authority in heaven and on earth, lo, he is with us always. What we cannot see is more real than what we can. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.